Okay, uh, well, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, uh, everyone, depending on where you're uh, uh, joining us from. Uh, and thanks for joining this session. Uh, my name is Charles Eckel. I'm a developer advocate at Cisco. And you may ask, well, what's a developer advocate? Well, we have a team at Cisco called DevNet, and it's for helping developers understand the, uh, the APIs and integration points of our products and our solutions, and then building on top of those. So uh, within that space, we have um, uh, several great developer advocates focusing, focusing on different aspects of Cisco tech, uh, technology. And when I joined the team, um, I came in to advocate for uh, two things that were very important to me. Uh, and uh, those are open source and standards. And I saw these as really great ways for us to interact with the developer community around uh, Cisco products and technologies, places where um, Cisco's uh, contributing to uh, open source projects and then using those open source projects in our products and solutions. Uh, especially in ways that are interesting to, to developers. Um, also places where we are uh, collaborating uh, and, and perhaps leading uh, standards efforts to standardize new things, which are then, uh, especially say networking technologies, which are then uh, those standards support for those is incorporated into our products and solutions. So I really advocate for uh, those spaces and working with developers in regards to open source and standards. Okay, so uh, open source and standards, I think uh, when many people think of those, you don't necessarily think as them being uh, directly opposed, but perhaps maybe not that related to each other. Um, however, you know, I believe that uh, standards and open source uh, really can be and should be very closely related and, and very beneficial to each other. Uh, perhaps in this, uh, uh, simplistic picture, uh, you know, the I think of the, the elephant kind of representing a more traditional view of standards, kind of slow moving, but steady. And, uh, and then the, the dog on top being, you know, perhaps a bit quicker and more agile, but also less predictable and, and perhaps going in different directions. Um, so here, you know, the, the, the fact that the two could possibly help each other out and work together. Um, is something that I believe is, is very important and um, that I certainly advocate for and try to make happen. And that's something that I'd like to talk with you a bit more about. So here we are at an open source um, conference. And so why this uh, focus on standards? Well, really uh, standards have played a key role um, in, in most industries. Uh, certainly in the networking space where I'm, I'm most familiar with the standards. And I think what we see is that uh, industry, they uh, really demand standards compliance from vendors. If you're going to offer products in a certain field, um, then you need to you know, comply with, with standards in that area. And uh, this is to ensure interoperability and also to you know, avoid vendor uh, lock-in. So uh, fortunately, vendors work very well together in general in these standards organizations. Um, even though they may be competitors, I think there's a kind of common value in having these standards. And uh, this is both to ensure interoperability uh, with between like say a Cisco solution with our partners and with our competitors, um, but it also just establishes credibility for, for our product uh, portfolio. And so there, there's lots of good reasons for, for vendors to uh, participate well in the standards organizations. So uh, for those of you maybe not quite as familiar with, with uh, the standards process, you may have at least some, some notions of how it goes. And I'd say traditionally in standards, what we've seen is that, um, you know, it takes a while to build consensus and form a standard. Uh, oftentimes that that takes a number of years. Now, once you get that consensus and you've reached that, then that's the time when you really start to see the standard uh, adopted and support added into products and solutions and taken to market. Um, the unfortunate reality is that oftentimes, even though multiple vendors have solutions that support the same standard, 
there's just enough ambiguity and uncertainty and kind of subject to interpretation in the specifications that those things don't, those independently designed solutions, uh, even though they implement the same standard, they don't quite work together, or at least not in all facets. So, you know, it actually takes a couple, you know, it takes a while then to get uh, interoperability, interoperable implementations of that standard working. Um, and, and while in general that does happen, which is fantastic, uh, the problem is, as you may have guessed, uh, this can take a, a really long time. And, uh, and so that, that's a, you know, a, a real challenge. Now contrast that with um, open source. And I think what we've seen here is the ability to transform an industry or a space very, very quickly. Um, in open source communities, we have people coming together, engaging, uh, working together collectively to innovate at a very, very rapid, rapid pace. Uh, things aren't subject to kind of meeting schedules and this building of, uh, you know, perfect consensus before going forward. A lot of times it's, you know, contribute some code, get someone to review it, commit it. Some people try it out. There's this more iterative cycle. Um, and it's really fantastic the type of innovation and, and speed that we've seen from all of this. And in some cases, uh, this could even result in a, a, like a de facto standard, right? If you have enough people contributing to a project, adopting it, integrating it into their, their product and solutions, um, that can happen. And uh, just to let you know, I do see uh, a couple of comments. And uh, if you have um, comments or questions, um, I'll try to answer them um, as we, uh, you know, so feel free to ask them. If, if, I'm, if I don't ask them at the time that you state them, uh, let me know, or sorry, I'll try to get to them at the end and I'll try to leave time to, to answer questions at the end. So hopefully um, I'll be able to answer all your questions. So while we see all these great benefits and speed and collaborativeness with, with open source, um, I'd say there is some complexity uh, involved with it and some real challenges. One thing is uh, typically when you look at an open source project, the way you go about uh, downloading, building, installing, using it, uh, there, there's some assembly required there. And because the project is a little bit more, say, general purpose, perhaps maybe not as well documented uh, as, as, say, something that you might get from a vendor who's offering you support for that. Um, you know, it's not universally the case that open source projects have poor documentation. I think as a community, we've been making great strides to focus on this and improve it. But still, the, the fact of the matter is many people would much rather uh, spend time developing new features, fixing bugs, doing those types of things, then going back and documenting them. And, uh, you know, it, it's something that we have to work on as, as a community, but can make it very difficult for, um, for someone who's trying to use our code. Uh, also, even when you have very well documented uh, and, and, and great uh, open source projects, they generally focus on a specific aspect, uh, pr provide some specific functionality they don't actually provide an entire solution, right? So in order to get a solution, what do you need to do? You need to take multiple different open source projects, perhaps write some code of your own, integrate them all together. That's the more realistic thing. So um, that's hard to do, especially as all these different projects are moving um, on their own tra trajectories, right? With their own release cycles and whatnot. So, so there are some real complexities and challenges with using open source and building a product on top of it, right? So uh, what I'm seeing or, or what I believe is that there's a, a huge opportunity for us to uh, benefit both the standards community and ourselves in the open source community by bringing these two worlds closer together and working more collaboratively. Really to bring that speed and, and, and spirit that we see with open source and, and bring that into standards efforts. And uh, to, to go and validate a standard as it's evolving, if you're actually implementing it at the same time that the specification's being written, that's a great way to value, uh, um, to validate the correctness and completeness 
and you know see if there are any ambiguities in that spec raise those issues forward and then get them addressed uh, similarly once a standard is being developed if we can add support for it into open source projects remember that industry really you know, relies on these standards so if our open source projects support those standards well that makes the the, the code more uh, usable by you know by those industries and if at the same time we're writing the standard we are uh, releasing libraries utilities perhaps implementations of those standards that that would make it easier for a product developer then to go and add support for those into their open source or even into their, their um, proprietary uh, technologies. So as an example of this, um, like look at that, the network automation space. Because uh, I think there's an awful lot going on there right now, both in uh, open source and in standards. In, in the keynote, for example, there was uh, several mentions of the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. I'd say one of the fastest growing and largest kind of uh, projects within the Linux Foundation, probably within the world right now. Uh, so a lot of attention here in the, uh, the Cloud Native uh, Compute Foundation. And that's really going across many different layers, if you think you know, kind of going from low level up to higher level in terms of the, the stack. That's the way this slide is arranged with open source projects on the left and standards on the right. So you see Cloud Native uh, Compute Foundation there. OPNFE was also mentioned, and that's kind of covering this whole stack and trying to bring uh, a solution together there. Um, open Daylight, uh, a controller in this space that I'm familiar with and contribute to along with other open source controllers, Onos, Open Contrail, uh, you know, in this space, all Linux Foundation products, projects. So you can see Linux Foundation really has multiple different open source projects at every level of the stack. Uh, similarly, on the right-hand side, if you look at the standards organizations that focus on different areas of, of this stack, um, the, the space is very well covered and uh, the standards organizations need to work closely with each other and in most cases hopefully you know do uh, to, to put a solution together and cover all the different aspects of, of network automation but there's really a, a great opportunity for people to cross that line right uh, that divide between open source and standards and vice versa and work more collaboratively with, with each other So uh, an example of a standards organization that is, I think, making good progress in this area is IETF. For those of you not familiar with IETF, it stands for Internet Engineering Task Force. And it's been around, um, let's see, for over 30 years now, uh, really created with the goal of defining the, the key protocols that, um, on which the Internet is based. Uh, things like TCP IP, DNS, uh, those kind of core components that are part of any uh, part of the internet and part of really any networking system that we use. Uh, now the goal is to really to make the internet continue to evolve and get better to meet the, the challenges um, as more and more people are using it for more and more things. So um, in the networking space, for example, applicable to network automation, there's networking protocols like VXLAN, GRE, but then there's all the uh, network programmability things around uh, Yang models and NetConf and RustConf. These are all um, network, all standards in the uh, network, that say are relevant to network automation. And, uh, and I think are also very, very relevant to the open source projects in this space. Now, I wanted to mention this kind of unofficial mantra of the IETF. You know, we reject kings, presidents, and voting. We believe in rough consensus and running code. Uh, the IETF is a very interesting place in that you participate as an individual and, you know, everyone can contribute um, independent of, say, their company. When I'm there, I don't act as a Cisco employee. I'm, I'm, I'm me and I'm contributing. Uh, I don't... Um, need like Cisco to sponsor that, for example. I think very much like open source, it's uh, 
I see a lot of similarities actually in the way that the communities are built out and how they work together. Now, uh, the challenges uh, in the IETF are, um, as you may expect, it, it's, it's a bit slow. Uh, and I think it's always been a little bit slow, but that was okay, perhaps, a number of years ago. Now with the, the pace of innovation, it, it's really becoming a, a problem because if the IETF spends too long working on a standard, uh, by the time that standard's ready, there's perhaps even an alternative that's come out a de facto standard based on an open source project or, or something like that. So that if you're not developing the standard in the time that it's needed, it's, it's not really useful. Uh, although there was that focus and the mantra on running code, what, what, what I've seen and what I think others have seen is that really the majority of the time and the effort is spent on achieving this rough consensus which is a very important thing that is done in the standards group, but uh, perhaps not like uh, enough emphasis on writing code. So we need a bit more of a shift toward uh, that software development practice and, and actually creating writing code. And uh, so these are things that the IETF realized were challenges and that it wanted to be able to, uh, to address. Doing that was, um, actually started and continue to run these hackathons within IETF. And that the goal there is to advance the pace and relevance of the standards that IETF is working on. And the way we do that is by uh, really fleshing out Im important ideas and concepts and then feeding those back into the working group uh, in like combination with working on the standard. So as the standard's evolving, we're implementing it, we're iteratively feeding information back in uh, from that uh, implementation experience, I would say, to continue to move things forward. Uh, it's also an attempt and uh, working very well to attract more developers, right? Typically in the IETF, the standards people were more like system architects, people who might not actually write or be very close to the developers and those who were implementing and adding support for the standards into the products. Now we're bringing more developers and uh, tends to be a bit of, of a younger community too and bringing them into the ITF and um, enabling them to really contribute meaningfully in ways that are important to them. So not just by necessarily reading a spec and you know, uh, participating in the meeting to form the rough consensus, but by writing some code and then illustrating through that that something does or doesn't work or something that needs to be addressed by the group. Uh, and that's been fantastic. These uh, hackathons are free and open to everyone, which really, you know, is great because it, it, it makes it easier for people to participate. And I need to point out they're very, they're collaborative. Uh, oftentimes hackathons might be construed as being, you know, very competitive and, uh, you know, working against each other. Um, so here the idea is very different. Um, there's no prizes, there's no winners. It's just everyone working together to move the IETF standard process forward. And certainly inner working across different working groups and different teams is, uh, it happens all the time and it's, it, it's welcome, it's celebrated. That's kind of one of the key reasons for getting everyone in the room together. Um, you can see the, uh, uh, when we first started the hackathon it was about five years ago and we had 45 people participating. And now that's grown to where we have three or 400 people participating. And if you put that in relation to how many people are coming to an IETF meeting, it's typically a thousand to 1200. And overall that number has slowly been declining. So here's that increasing, you know, aspect of IETF where 40, 30, 40% of the people who are participating in the meeting overall actually show up the weekend before, which is when we have these, to uh, uh, participate. Um, we're actually going to try this time to do something we've never done before and have a virtual hackathon. Uh, it's challenging because a, a lot of the synergies come from putting people, like bringing them together and having them in the room together. But uh, that's obviously something we can't do, much like we can't meet for this conference together. So we're gonna to try to do what we can. 
And uh, let's see. So here's an example of how the IETF as a community is, is embracing uh, and in trying to engage developers more. There's actually, uh, you know, this is a, we're, we're using GitHub um, and we created a GitHub org for the hackathon. And so then what we did was we, that's where we um, work on our project presentations and not that all the code needs to be there. If you look, you'll see there's only a, really a small number of, of, of projects there. But the majority of the projects tend to have a home somewhere else, maybe not even necessarily on GitHub, maybe um, you know, hosted on, on GitLab somewhere or Bitbucket, or, but it's somewhere that people can get access to, and, and that's critical. But here, we're trying to meet developers where they are and, and make it easier for them to participate. Along those same lines, there was actually a working group created within IETF to look at how can um, IETF working groups use uh, tools like Git and, and, and GitHub um, more effectively to put some kind of best practices and guidelines in place. Uh, basically, the IETF usually uses a bunch of homegrown tools, which, which are very good, but they're non-intuitive to a developer. So now the idea is let's take tools that developers are already using and uh, let's try to use them to help with our standards process. And you can see here, there's actually a GitHub URL associated with the, uh, the charter page of this working group. And, and this is what it looks like. It just spells out those rules for here are some guidelines. You don't need to use these, but here's uh, kind of some best practices and thoughts about how you would want to make use of, of GitHub better. And a lot of it relates to how do you take a community that's traditionally worked with mainly emails, email uh, aliases and, and mailing lists, and now integrate in a uh, more of a web-based workflow around GitHub into that. An example of that is this quick working group within IETF. Uh, quick for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's, it's defining a new a uh, new version of HTTP, sometimes called HTTP v3, and it's running on top of actually UDP as, as, a, as a base. Um, it's a very quickly moving, very uh, a lot of people collaborating in this space. And, and um, so it's a really good test and an example of how collaborating with, um, you know, using Git and GitHub has allowed a lot more people to, uh, mainly developers, to uh, review drafts very quickly and provide comments in a way that is very intuitive to them and doesn't require them to learn a whole new infrastructure. And so I think this working group is really seeing very rapid development, despite the fact that it's a, a pretty controversial, contentious, and very uh, a lot of stakeholders. Uh, so it's, it's a good success story, I think, for the IETF and something that we'll continue to, to see more of. Okay, so an example of where this is working relatively well from an open source perspective, I would say, would be with Open Daylight. I, I mentioned Open Daylight earlier in the presentation. Uh, it's really a, a platform, I would say, uh, for software-defined networking. And uh, thought of as a, uh, an SDN controller, a network controller. I, I don't plan to go into all the details of it, uh, but what I'm using here is just a block diagram that shows the, the components, the various components of open daylight. And on the next slide, what I'll do is light up in green, and hopefully this comes through for most of you. Um, those components that are directly related to IETF standards, and I'm sure many others actually have relation in them, but these ones, even by name, you can see the, uh, the IETF standards that are related to it. Uh, starting from the bottom, you have like the, the virtual and the physical devices, the actual network equipment. Above that is this layer where all the different uh, protocols are. These are ways for interacting with those network devices. Um, you can see NetConf, LISP, BGP, PSAP, CAPWAP, uh, others, all IETF standards. And there's basically drivers or modules that 
um, so that you can inter interact, uh, open daylight can inter interact with devices that support those standard protocols. And, and this, this was critical to making open daylight uh, a usable platform for all of these network devices that um, exist in, in people's deployed networks today. In the middle, you see different kind of network services. Uh, that's where there's uh, Lisp services, uh, service function chaining, several IETF uh, standards in that area. Uh, Uni Manager, which is implementing um, standards developed in uh, IETF for network programmability, but also in MEF for network services. Also, there's a, a group in IETF defining standards in that area as well. And then moving up the stack, all the ways that Open Daylight can interface with applications, because that's really the goal of Open Daylight is for uh, to provide a platform on which you write network applications, and that's using standard uh, protocols, uh, REST, and then ones that have been developed in the ITF, RESTConf and NetConf. Um, those are standard protocols that you can use to to interact um, for higher level applications to interact with Open Daylight. So to me, this is really a great success story where key standards that are relevant in the space are being developed and uh, added into uh, the open source project. Okay, transitioning a little bit. Um, and I do see there's a couple questions on, on IPR and that's, uh, I'll come back and try to answer those at the end. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but, um, I can give you my take on some of that. It's kind of a, a challenging thing, and uh, we could probably spend a lot of time discussing it. I'll, I'll try to leave several minutes for that uh, at the end. We're doing pretty well on time. So MEF, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, MEF was really the the place where carrier Ethernet, if you've heard that, uh, that term, um, uh, I'd say MEF, developed and brought the whole carrier ethernet market to space. This is how do multiple different service providers uh, who are using network equipment from different vendors, how do they offer network services to you as a uh, network connectivity to you as a, say as an enterprise or a subscriber and doing that in a standards standard based way such that you could say, yes, this equipment actually supports the carrier Ethernet standards, or this service provided by the service provider is uh, compliant with those um, with that standard. And really, what that did was that helped different service providers interoperate with each other and help the whole industry move from uh, really disparate, hard to compare uh, apples to oranges types of service to a more ubiquitous level of service. And so the carrier Ethernet market just completely took off. And I'd say MEF has pretty much addressed and, and um, solved that problem for the industry. Now, what MEF is doing is moving up the stack, defining higher level network services beyond just basic connectivity services. And, and so that's really the, the goal of MEF now. And so those same networking automation specifications, standards, and open source projects that we've looked at are very relevant to what MEF is trying to do now as well. So as you might have guessed, uh, well, you know, how do we how do we address this and try to make it happen? Well, let, let, let's let's try having some hackathons there as well. Uh, MEF is not a place where developers would typically go and participate, and this was an attempt to try to uh, address that gap. I would say. So um, similar to an IETF, the idea was, hey, let's bring these open source hackathons in and let's try to take what the focus, which was typically on to find some uh, services and then certify those services. Let's shift that focus a bit more to actually defining some APIs and then writing code that implements those APIs and making that part of our standards process. With that same idea of validating that those APIs are complete and that they're useful and that you can build uh, services on top of them. And that's going to enable much more um, interactive communication between different service providers, between subscribers and service providers to really realize this sort of more automated, more dynamic uh, network services. Also collaboration between 
across different STOs and with open source communities was, was a real goal of this. Now, this had a really uh, profound impact, I would say, on MEF. And what we saw was the shift from uh, really just focusing on services, defining of services, and then the certification of equipment and uh, providers of those services to incorporate much more than just that. So you see uh, within MEF, there was a creation of, of two uh, completely new components, I guess I would say, to complement the service and certification approach. One was around APIs. LSO stands for Lifecycle Service Orchestration. So these are really APIs that will help with the, the automation of network services, uh, both east-west uh, between service providers and north-south as you go up and down that network automation stack. And then super important and probably the thing I wanted to focus on is the community aspect actually realizing that it's important to work with developers, to have very open and collaborative uh, development of uh, SDKs, of sample applications, of sample clients and servers in this space that actually implement these APIs and, and start to realize you know, the, the use of them and make sure that it's not just a service that we're defining on paper that you can really only interact with through certification, but that you can interact with it through code as well. And then just one more example. This is not a standards organization, but the uh, AIS, it, it's a, a, a conference um, held in Africa, the African Internet Summit, and it's held annually. And the African Internet Summit um, and, the, uh, um, and the Internet Society that works closely with uh, the African Internet Summit, uh, really one of the goals there is to help, I would say, uh, increase awareness of IETF standards and where they're applicable within that space. And there's a goal to try to help, uh, get more people participating, like to make it easier for people from, uh, from Africa, whether they, they be developers or say people in the standard space, it tends to be a little bit harder for them in many cases for a number of reasons to participate in the IETF standards meetings, either because of challenges related to logistics of, of getting there. Um, and then also the fact that the IETF meetings tend to not go and be held in Africa. They tend to be held in North America and Europe and various parts of Asia. So the goal here was let's bring um, the IETF standards and an event focused on them into Africa and engage developers there, really build some technical capacity around those standards, um, work on deploying those standards, like getting hands-on experience with them and then actually deploying them. And that same idea of uh, when you deploy or use a standard or try to implement it, you, you gain experience with it and you can feed back what you've learned into the standards process. And so that really enables contribution back from the African community into the IETF standards in, in new and interesting ways. So all of the projects there were related to IETF standards, and you can see a number of them here. Uh, I led the, the, the first one here on network programmability that was really focused on implementing those, um, those same standards protocols that I mentioned before in the network programmability space namely Yang and Yang models, and then NetConf and RESTConf, which are um, protocols by which you interact with those, uh, those Yang models and the APIs that are defined by them. So uh, it was really great collaboration and just another example of how uh, engaging with developers, in this case, developers in Africa, to really facilitate their participation and contribution back into the standards process. So my, uh, my takeaway for you and really my call to action for you is I, I hope that through this discussion and the Q&A Q &A session that we'll have afterwards, that, that you agree with me that there's a, a really a great opportunity here for us to bring uh, open source and standards together and for the two communities to really work well together. Um, so I'd like to see this uh, championing this combination of open source and standards 
with the goal really to uh, make standards that are being developed uh, in places like IETF, in places like MEF, make those standards much more consumable by developers. And the way we do that is by developing open source uh, libraries, utilities, components in parallel with the uh, development of the standard. So now you don't just have a specification, you actually have code that you can start using right away uh, to help with your understanding of the standard, your implementation and deployment of the standard, and hopefully with incorporating support for that standard into key open source projects. When we get the standards incorporated into key open source projects, then that enables this industry that relies on standards-based implementations to really use our open source. And so that opens up just uh, the space um, for our, our open source projects to really be incorporated into the solutions of say these service providers in the case of MEF. And now you start to see much more contribution and support and sponsorship coming uh, from these organizations because they can tie back you know, they're getting material benefit from the open source projects and those open source projects are really important to their business. Uh, one way you can do this is, um, I mentioned earlier, the next IETF hackathon. This will be at IETF 108, which is at the end of July. And instead of having the hackathon be the weekend before IETF, which it typically is, uh, we're going to move it to the entire week before. And this is because time zones are so challenging and the weekend is not, uh, it's easier for people to give up the weekend when they're all traveling to a place and they get there early and they work together for two days. But when everyone's working from home, there didn't seem to be that same driver or desire to, to spend the weekend working on it, especially with the differences in time zones. So this allows people to carve out time within their week when it's convenient for the individual project team. And so we'll have a set of teams working on different projects related to IHF technologies. And I would love for you to check it out. Um, it'd be great to see some projects where what's happening there is incorporating IETF standards as they're evolving into important open source projects in this space. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go back and spend a little bit of time on the Q&A, and I welcome those of you who have questions, um, go ahead and, and put them in, and I'll try to answer them as best I can. Um, okay, first one says, uh, great point, Charles. Happy that you and Cisco are members of Oasis Open, uh, where we are trying hard to merge open source and, stand for, and standards in meaningful ways. Um, so that's fantastic. Uh, Oasis Open, uh, I guess another example where these worlds are already making progress of coming together. And I think in the, uh, the keynote, we saw a few things the Linux Foundation is doing and really great progress in this area as well. So um, IETF and MEF are two places that I'm very familiar with. Fortunately, there's other places that may be even ahead of what we're doing in, in IETF and MEF. And if so, that, that's fantastic. So, so great to hear that there's, there's good work um, going on there as well. Uh, next one. Um, Charles, uh, would love to hear more about how we deal with IPR issues in the merge between open source and standards. Um, that has sometimes been a bottleneck. Yeah, so IPR is certainly has been and will continue to be a, a challenge in standards industries. And I, you know, the, I think the same reason it would be a challenge in open source. The model that I'm most familiar with is probably that in the IETF again, where the idea is if you have IPR in a space, um, you're obligated to, uh, to declare that, um, that IPR that you have. And typically the way this would work would be, let's say at Cisco, we have some IPR related to a standard that, that we're uh, proposing or, or helping uh, the industry propose. What we would do is say, hey, we do have this IPR and we will make it, uh, we will license it uh, for fair and reasonable terms. Um, and uh, that way people know that uh, there's potential IPR associated with this um, standard or the key I left out there. And again, I'm not a lawyer, so don't hold me to the exact terms of this, but you can use our IP for the purpose of implementing the standard. 
And uh, so you're, you're kind of free to do that. You're given a license for that. You can't use it just in, in perhaps other ways, but that way it allows the standard and the implementation of the standard to um, be free of perhaps very, uh, any real big negative um, IPR problems. And I would think for open source, we can and should be doing something kind of um, similar. But um, there is that group, and sorry that I don't know the name of it. I, I tried to make a note of it. The one within Linux Foundation, the new project that's helping to um, merge these two worlds together and to help um, standards like behave a little bit more like an open source project. I would sure they have people in, in there that are very good at dealing with this and hopefully can do a better job th than I am. Um, are there challenge, uh, Ray says, are there challenges in terms of IP or legal? Yeah, when trying to collaborate between. So, so pretty much the same question, I guess. And, and yeah, there, there are, but I don't think they're new, at least, um, you know, like I said, we had to do this in the standards community. And I would think in the open source community, they're going to be a little bit similar. Uh, in the standards community, you have your rules and procedures and uh, kind of your, your terms that everyone agrees to. In the IETF, there's something called the note well. And you know that at every single IETF meeting, you're operating under those policies. And when you contribute something, you're basically contributing it to the standards process. You know, so when you speak in a meeting, when I'm speaking at this conference, I'm essentially contributing to uh, to that that uh, to the, the the process there, either to the open source community or to the standards organization. Um, so I think we probably need to have something like that, and it gets a little bit more challenging, I think, because of the different open source licenses. And again, I'm not an expert here, but you know, some open source licenses make it very explicit that they're granting you. Um, uh, granting you a right to the, the IP associated, potentially associated with that code. Others, it's not quite as clear. Um, so I think that's what you'll see open source projects, you know, making sure that they use licenses that carry the right IP policies along with them. Uh, that, that's one thing we can definitely do to make sure that uh, these two worlds come together a little bit better. And John asks, um, how do you see the relationship between standards bodies and the various consortiums being spun up by hyperscalers and hardware manufacturers playing out? Um, I don't know because I don't uh, I don't participate real actively in that space. Um, it sounds like they are. You're, you're saying that they. Um, so it, perhaps it's a little bit new of a, of a space, I guess, compared to some of the others. Like the networking space, we didn't see good collaboration at all between open source and standards. It took some time, but now we're there. IoT, uh, there's tons of different consortiums, different standards groups. Um, I think that's something where a place where the Linux Foundation can really help to bring those worlds together and uh, to kind of the beauty of open source is, and even of standards, is there's so many of them, but it's also a challenge at the same time, right? Because you you don't want to stifle innovation, but you want to kind of guide it in certain directions and um, avoid kind of d different solutions if they actually aren't useful and beneficial to the community. So I think there's a role we can all play by being aware of these things. Don't ignore um, consortiums, open source projects in this space. If you see them, don't purposely, you know, ignore them. I would reach out to them and engage with them. And I think the Linux Foundation, um, with its kind of credibility with being able to do this, would be a, a you know a key place to help with that kind of larger problem of bringing those you know those different manufacturers uh, together. Um, and ARPIT has some uh, uh, IPR answers. Um, uh, MEF and LF have an agreement that allows formal collaboration for SDOs and OSS projects. So that's fantastic. Uh, these agreements between LF and SDO allow for implementing standards in code and also push code into upstream uh, standards with open source friendly licenses on interfaces. Yeah, so fantastic, Arpit. That, that's great to hear and that makes a lot of sense. Again, by choosing the right and appropriate um, licenses there, that can remove a lot of that ambiguity, I think. 
And, uh, and that's certainly helpful. And that's where, you know, Linux Foundation has great experience here and can really help navigate that space. And that's one of the reasons for talking about this uh, at this conference. So, um, so thanks a lot for that, Arpit. That's great. Uh, any other questions? We have a, a few minutes left if there's anything else. If you did ans ask a, a question and I missed it, my apologies, but as far as I can tell, uh, I got through them. Um, if after this session you want to reach out to me at any time, um, my you can reach out to me via email, via um, uh, Twitter. My email is eckelcu at uh, cisco.com. And on Twitter, I'm the same. I'm eckelcu uh, as my hashtag. You can reach me there. If you look at my bio, hopefully that's there. I don't know if it is. Um, but I'm happy to connect with you through the uh, uh, through this platform too. I, I hope we all. Uh, I'm, so far, I'm enjoying using this uh, uh, this new platform and, and meeting virtually. Um, of course, I miss seeing all of you in person, but uh, this is much better than not having been able to uh, to meet at all. So uh, excited to have had this opportunity. Thanks a lot for tuning in and listening. And uh, with that, let me check the Q and A one more time. And if there's nothing new. Uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and close the session then. Uh, thanks so much. I look forward to engaging with you throughout the rest of the week um, at various uh, other talks and uh, in the virtual chat rooms and whatnot. So uh, yeah, thanks for joining. Please enjoy uh, the rest of the conference.